recording. Greetings and uh, it's a uh, good morning to our fellows at the Fellowship National Certificate for Mediators in Kenya, an ongoing program, five months, uh, starting off from July to November, that is dedicated towards the development of conflict transformation mediators as part of the program on conflict transformation, uh, hosted by Wasiliana Hub together with uh, partners, the Catholic University of Eastern Africa and uh, the American Spaces, USC Marafiki, together with a great team of coaches who we have been able to uh, have in the previous months. And we will also be having as we carry on in the new months that are uh, remaining in the program. I greet all the fellows and the coaches uh, who are on this uh, call today. And uh, today is on the 18th day of September in the year 2021. This is our session from 10 a.m. to 12 noon. This is our smart weekend. And during the smart weekend, we have a focus on two areas. One, tech or technology and ODR, online dispute uh, resolution. And that we will be supported by our fellowship coach, Morenike Obi-Farinde, who is the founder of the ODR Africa Network in Nigeria. And the other part of the program is the uh, wellness focus, which in this month, our focus is on financial wellness, to which we are supported by our ongoing fellowship coach, Coach Maina Azimio. So with this, I will start us off with the words of our national anthem, Wimbo wa Taifa, as our prayer for our nation, for our families, and for the whole world. E mungu nguvietu. Ilete baraka kwetu, haki iwe ngao na mlinzi, na tukae na undugu, amani na uhuru, raha tupate na ustawi. Welcome once again, karibu sana to our fellowship program today on the, 20, on the 18th day of September in the year 2001. Our program today, right after this introduction, we move into our first segment, which is the, within this hour, the workshop with our fellowship coach, Coach Maina on financial wellness. Then we will have a five minutes break followed by our second part of the of our workshop with Coach Morenike Obi-Farinde on technology and ODR. So at this juncture, Karibu Sana, fellowship coach, Coach Maina Azimio. Coach Maina, good morning to you. Coach Maina? Okay. Okay, so we welcome uh, Coach Maina. Hello, Coach Maina. We can see your screen. Uh, we can see your screen, and uh, you probably can just get it onto uh, full uh, full mode. One minute. Yes. Hello. Good morning. Uh, yes, now, uh, now we can we can see your screen and uh, we we cannot see you now, but uh, you can get onto your video now. I think you're settled now. Yes, see me. Yes, we can see you, and you can set your the screen to be on full screen on uh, full screen. That that. Okay, okay Coach Maina. Yes, we can see you, Karibu Sana. Yes, wonderful. Thank you. And yeah, yeah, and yeah. Thank you so much for. And uh, uh, one of the things that uh, we know is that uh, this is your first love. So uh, it makes us wonder about all the other people who are around you, how they feel. And uh, I think today we'll just really get to experience um, why you got into this work, and uh, even as you've circled in and put in the other aspects of um, uh, emotional wellness, the other aspects that relate to uh, the the uh, uh, physical health aspects relating to mental wellness. I think today you'll just be helping us to just see where this comes in all together. So Karibu Sana, 
uh, kindly introduce yourself so that we can be able to just have uh, to get to know who you are and move on. So Karibu uh, Coach Maina, you have this segment of the hour. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Ogere. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to be back to this uh, series of talks. This being the third one, we've had two before. So I'm not new to most of you, unless the new ones who have come in, but uh, quickly for my introduction, you know your speaker. I'm a trained and certified professional coach accredited to International Coaching Federation. I'm also trained and certified professional mediator. I mediate conflicts, especially in the business area and succession uh, is all about property. I'm an entrepreneurship trainer, very passionate about helping people to know how wealth is created on the entrepreneurship space. I am a startup age investor and also a venture capitalist. I capitalize businesses. So if anybody who want to do business and they have money issues, you can talk to me. I am a business consultant and a mentor. I'm a Pan-Africanist at heart. I started FABA for Africa by Africans in 2014. When I realized, I went around a number of Kenyan, uh, African countries and I realized that like Kenya, most African countries import almost everything, including pangas, jembes, slashers, and almost even the crude items. And I thought it's time that Africans started making what we use. And I started for Africa by Africans to help our African people to start producing what we use. Uh, I am also a Tony Elumelu Foundation uh, Entrepreneurship Mentor. Right now we are judging this. Anybody who applied to be funded uh, by Tony Elumelu Foundation, that is what you are doing. So mm -hmm. I, more than that, I am my other entrepreneur, how I became who I have told you I am. Uh, mm -hmm. I am a serial entrepreneur. I have started 19 businesses directly. There are many others I have started with other people but these 19 are personal. Five of them failed flat when I was beginning because of lack of experience. I have continued with the businesses, even with the five failures, I have formed another 14. I have sold five so far. Nowadays I sell businesses and I have one foundation, I'm running nine. I'm passionate about wealth creation through entrepreneurship. And this is what I'll be speaking more today uh, I'm a trained and certified man enough mentor. I realize men are being left behind. Ladies empowerment has really gone far, which is good, but I also want our ladies to get responsible men to marry them. I have a daughter and I love her. So I would like her to get a good husband, not just any other man in trouser. But my area of strength is financial intelligence. I coach people in financial intelligence, which will be looking at what it means. I advise my micro, small and medium enterprises on how to scale their business using my experiences that one have gained over the time I have been working on this. And I advise on succession planning. And that's why I am an experiential trainer. All these things I have done are the ones who have made me to be who I am today. And I share that experience. There's a quote here by Henry Ward that one's best success comes after their greatest disappointments. I was disappointed by many things, but I kept going. I like telling people at least a disclaimer of whom I'm not, because I'm not a motivation speaker. Don't take me to be the motivation speaker because I'm not, I'm neither an inspiration speaker. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with them, but that I'm not. I tell people that some truth, which is not very good. And uh, today, if I bruise you, uh, just forgive me, I don't mean to hurt you, but when you're talking about money, I know some people will get hurt, but allow me to say it. I am not a comedian, neither am I an entertainer, but I try to use humor when it's possible to inspire my audience to bring big and manifest your dreams. Above all, I am a holistic wellness champion and preventive health trainer. 
and I, I, I won't repeat this, preventive health trainer. Welcome to today's session. Uh, we have already covered two of the pillars of wellness. We have done physical health, that's where it started, because the whole body that God gave us to take care of, we saw how complex it is. And for us to be able to stay out of sicknesses, which are taking us down so early and also consuming a lot of money in hospitals, we've got to know how to take care of our body. That we covered. Then you came on, that was on 17th of July. On, uh, in August, we focused on mental wellness, our mind, because we are what we think. If you don't think in a positive way, you will manifest that negativity. So we covered at length what it means uh, to be mentally well, what we need to do, and more of what we need to stop doing. Because there are some things which are doing which are messing us up. So those two we covered, and I hope that you can remember what we did much of it. Congratulations for all those who have been uh, applying the knowledge that we learned. But through this, all what we have learned so far, all the aspirations that we have, they will come to nothing if we don't have the money to help us make them happen. Money is an enabler of all what you have been learning and more that is going to come. Today we'll focus on the third dimension of wellness, which is money, financial wellness. So briefly, I would want to take us through some few terms that we'll be going through as we go along this area. And before that, let me say this. Wangare, when uh, you asked me to speak on this, there's no, I try to squeeze information together to fit within 50 minutes for financial wellness, and it is difficult. So if I do not cover it, give it justice, just uh, bear with me, maybe another time Wangare can uh, invite me or you can come to me and I, we can look at it in a deeper way, but allow me to just highlight. For us to talk about financial wellness, there are some terms which we use interchangeably and most of them don't mean the same thing, but we use them interchangeably, and sometimes we confuse. So what is finance? And what is money? Finance and money are not the same thing. What is wealth? Money is not wealth. What is fiscal policy? When you talk of fiscal policy, what does it mean? You cannot be good in what you do not understand or you don't have clarity about. So I want to ask you to go to the chat box and write what this means, what is finance, what do you understand? And there's no answer that is wrong. All answers are okay. It's your understanding of this as of now, because honestly, you know, you know something about it. So I just want to see if we can connect. Just go to the chat box and tell me what you understand of finance, money, wealth, and fiscal policy. I have a quote, a quote here for finance, which I'll not read now because I want to hear what you say first. Then I want to go to money, chapa. So what is money? Money basically is the medium by which all earthly successes are measured. I repeat, all what we understand about money, this is my definition of money after all said and done, because we know, whatever you call it. But money is the medium by which all earthly successes are measured. Example, the best house costs the most money. There's no doubt about that. Ukienda Karen, Mudaiga, Nauko Kwingine, where Mambo Ikomzuru Padehizu. The best house you'll get there in the right location also, because you have to combine many factors. You cannot build a good house in a poor area, then you say that it's going to cost most. It won't. Look at this also. The best players are paid the most money. Money measures successes. The best hotels charge the most money. 
So you can see uh, money measures value. Next, what is wealth? I said money and wealth are not the same, they are different. Wealth is evidence of valuable material possessions or knowledge. We normally say that he has a wealth of knowledge. He has a wealth of knowledge. So if you have an evidence of valuable, it must be valuable also because you can have a lot of materials, but they are worthless. So evidence of valuable material possessions or knowledge. So which are these valuable material possessions that you have or you aspire to have? That I want to hear from you, just go to the chat box and uh, mention some of the things that can qualify to become wealth. If you have many valuable assets, you can be said to be wealthy. Valuable assets, what are assets? What are assets? Because this is another term that we also use interchangeably. Sometimes you don't understand it very well. So we end up not getting ourselves at the best level. So I would like us to get clarity today because where we are heading to, we are heading into a place where we need to get everything aligned. And I'm saying, if you have many, that means it is a, but there's an exception. What is the exception? You can have many valuable assets, but you're not wealthy. Why? Because there's another thing called debt. When you have many debts, they might cancel out your wealth. So you must balance the two. So whatever you have as wealth, you must first and foremost subtract all the liabilities. So again, that is a debt, we'll be covering that. And that's why I said that we cannot be able to cover everything today. But I will actually just flip through and I give you ideas on what you can do. So what is the difference between being rich, another one we normally confuse, affluent and wealthy? When you say somebody is affluent and somebody is rich, somebody is wealthy, what do we mean? Which one of the three are you? I'd like you to tell me where you operate from. Rich, a rich person. What is the difference between a rich person and a wealthy person? I want you to tell me that one on the chat box. I will not uh, explain it. I want you to tell me what it means. Affluence, what do you understand by affluence? I want you to tell me on the chat box because I want us to discuss this together. It is something that we have been doing since Tuku Atoto Adogo. So we know we understand these things. Maybe the fiscal policy, some people might not have thought much about it because this is more at a higher level, it's government. And the fiscal policy, the one I can actually say it's a, the actions of the government in deciding how much and on what to spend and how it, its spending will be funded, the budget. Our finance, uh, our finance minister normally read our budget and explain how the budget will be. This year, the, the budget, you know how much they read, 3.6 trillion, and also where the money will come from. That's a fiscal policy. But anyway, that is theirs. The measure of all the above is money. So what is this thing called money? Chapa. Besha, for those who come from Mount Kenya like me here, Shekel. They have many names. Remember Jesus was sold some, some money anyway, some, some form of money anyway, some of those coins, Jesus, after all the work he did on planet Earth. So you can see how money has been used in many ways. Money is the most widely used medium of exchange. And most people by the way just use money as a medium of exchange, but money is much more than just a medium of exchange. Why is money the most widely used among others? And what are those others? Here is a brief evolution of money and how we use money as a medium of exchange. Before we, have, we had quarry shells and beads then far salt, even opium. You remember the opium war in China? Opium was being used as a currency 
First and foremost, we started with a butter trade. What you have, you come, we exchange. But now the value was now the problem because not all items are of the same value. And that's why money came in and was able to facilitate the exchange. Because Kikuyus and Masai especially, I'm a Kikuyu, I'll be giving examples more from where I come from. Uh, we used to exchange value with Masai who were keeping animals. We were growing food crops. So we give them the food crops, they give us goats. And goats became the currency in Kikuyu. If you marry a Kikuyu lady, you'll be told how many goats you'll pay for it. Even land was being valued in goats, but goats originally, they were Masai and were neighbors. So we used to share and exchange. Of course, when the young men are feeling energetic, they also used to fight a bit. Uh, so that time, goats and food were being used as the currency. So later, we started having money as a measure of value. They used to measure how many goods would go for how many bananas. The next level of money is as a store of value. Money is a store of value. How many other stores of values do you know? Gold, silver are the most popular in storing value. So the moment you understand money, you can now be able now to go to how you're going to do it and how you make money, what you do with your money, because this is where it's most critical. But that's history background. It's important for us to be able to capture where we are coming from with money. What else is money? Money is power. Yes, we are now going to campaign. And you know, the guys will be elected, unfortunately, even as professionals, we also play the same way. We vote for people because they have money. And you can see the kind of characters we have elected of late as governors in Nairobi. I don't want to mention their name, Kiambu here in Mombasa. So many things. And uh, we voted those characters. Why? Because of the power of money. But above that, money is an, an, an enabler. It enables so many things. When I tell you that you're supposed to eat well, it doesn't come cheap. When I tell you you're supposed to be going to the gym or you have your own house gym, it doesn't come cheap. All the things that I'm telling you to do, you need to go for a holiday to relax. It's important. It doesn't come cheap. You need to live in a clean environment because if you live in a polluted environment, you are going to get respiratory diseases which are going to bring you down. Aha, another problem. So money, if you don't have it, honestly, forget about wellness. And that's why I normally say my first love, not that I love money so much, but I recognize that you can't do much without money. Money can afford you most, if not all of your heart's desires. It's frustrating to desire good things and you can't afford them. It's even affect your mental wellness because if you're aspiring something you cannot afford, it is going to affect, it affects your emotional wellness, which we'll be discussing next month. We are creatures of emotions. Wangari, read for me this. I didn't come with my co-hosts, just read for me this. Uh, uh, whoever said money can't buy happiness, whoever said money can't buy happiness, simply didn't know where to go shopping. Whoever said money can't buy happiness, simply did, didn't know where to go shopping. That's by Bo Derek. Thank Do you, you agree with him? Do you agree with him? Oh, I, I, yes, and I know where to go shopping, so I agree. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good, very good. So we're on the same page now, and let's dive in and uh, we handle this properly, because honestly, <laughs> When you have money and you know how to choose where to buy, where to spend it, you will get happiness. When you don't have money, you get stress and happiness will not be part of you. To this, in today's world, money is only next to oxygen. Money is only next to oxygen. And I think where we are now with pollution, Money has actually assumed a different dimension because you can't stay in a clean environment without money. Can you? We have got a lot of pollution and the most 
expensive estates have got their lush green. You pay <laughs> an arm and a leg to be able to stay in the green city. The parts that we have got green city are the trees. So money is also part of it. We all know about uh, the needs and want and uh, the way they were classified by Maslow back in 1953. Now it has changed. If Maslow lived today, this is my proposition. If Maslow lived today, he could possibly review his hierarchy of needs and put just two. All what you need is oxygen because the one trillion cells we found that is make our body and the organs, 78 organs, they can't live without oxygen. And God gave us to us free oxygen. Then, but not now, hey, nowadays you get oxygen. You remember people are dying in a hospital now because they can't afford oxygen, ventilators. You remember there's a doctor who passed on in a, waiting for 200,000 to be put on oxygen, very sad, a very young doctor, uh, because of lack of chapa. If you have money, you can buy all the other things, including oxygen to a certain level, because your body if you cannot be able to take oxygen, you'd need to have it through other way. Money isn't everything, but it runs up there with oxygen. That is Zig Ziglar. Who said that? It is not everything, yes, but it lands up there. Disclosure. Money can buy you oxygen. When you are going hiking up to a certain level, we buy oxygen to carry it up because you see the higher you go, the more uh, 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 oxygen thins out. There are places that are, you have got very little oxygen, it can't supply enough oxygen to your body. So money is required for you to be able to even do that. Air pollution is minimal in locations that costs an arm and a leg. And you can see, honestly, without money, that's where you stay, where the pollution is highest. And you're going to hospital become a big problem. If you are sick, the kind of a hospital that you can afford is determined by how much money you have. To be put on a ventilator, another bill will come. There's a bill for just being given oxygen. By the way, it doesn't come cheap. It doesn't. East African oxygen, they're making a lot of money because of selling air. So how do we earn this thing called money? We make, earn, or get into. So how do you earn your money? I want this now a conversation. How do you earn your money? Because all of us spend money. All of us interact with this thing called money. How do we handle this money? How do you earn your money? And I would like to hear from you now at that juncture. We all interact, receive or earn money. Majority are not good shepherds of money. The middle class, who we are, and professionals receive and spend it as quickly as it comes. Mishahara ikilipoa, ama ukilipa yu fee note after doing a job, ikifika tu para para, quickly, quickly you spend it, then you are back to where you are. By the way, most people stay broke more, most of the time. They get money very few times. They are, they are liquid very few times. Most of the time they are broke. And that's why in Kenya, there's a proliferation of digital loans. Very sad. You'll be surprised to see the people who are going for those digital loans, not just the low class, even the middle class are, professionals are, and people are borrowing too much. Banks are having so many debts from us. Why? Because we don't know how to relate with money. Now, I want us to look at this and see what is this that is making us not be good shepherds of money. Uh, I want to ask you, Angari, again, can you read for me this? Help me read this so that we can be able to get these points and ask. I want to ask you, is it what relate with you here? Angari, help me this. Okay. So the, 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 the topic is the middle class causes of financial stress. And uh, the first one is spending what you have not earned. 
uh, and that includes credit cards, Fuliza, circle loans, um, et cetera. Number two, buying expensive gadgets, smartphones, and pressure to upgrade to the latest. Number three, buying a car on loan as a status symbol. In other words, a car is not a sign of wealth. Number four, living in expensive locations to have bragging rights. Number five, signing up for a mortgage with a higher monthly repayment than the rental income. Number six, take kids to expensive schools to impress or to fit in. Number seven, unnecessary family outings instead of home food. Number eight, expensive holidays, even on credit. Number nine, throwing expensive birthday, expensive birthday and anniversary parties instead of spending more time together. Number 10, grand weddings and family functions. Number 11, high spend on social tax, including fundra uh, fundraisers for funerals, hospital bills, pre-weddings to impress or maintain a fake reputation. Number 12, high spend on medical bills due, due to poor lifestyle. Number 13, subscription like DSTV, Netflix, Home Fiber, Fiber you rarely use, or secondly, membership in clubs you visit occasionally. Number 14, obsession with brands for clothes, shoes, bags that cost an arm and a leg. Number 15, FOMO, fear of uh, FOMO, spending not to be left out, not to suit own needs. So their conclusion is spending emotionally eventually leads to anxiety and financial stress. Income is not growing at the same rate. This leads to financial stress and it can cause depression. Thank you, Coach Maina, back to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you again for that. Uh, I want to ask now the participants, where are you, do this talk to you and uh, are you doing this, Julia Maina? Because uh, we are looking at why people are struggling with money. What do we do with it when it comes? Are we good shepherds of money? Because I'm very concerned that our people are dying instead of uh, following the Bible teaching that a good parent leaves inheritance to their children that goes to the fourth generation. They are depending on their on their, their children. Uh, you know, by the way, for our parents, you can forgive them because Kenya just got independence. They are the ones who fought for independence. Like my parents is the age that fought for independence. That time things were very difficult. They were disrupted and they didn't know what we know. So at least then I have carried those burdens personally of my parents and my siblings. I know most of you have done that. But the question is, will you do the same? That your children... <laughs> Are your retirement plan today, in this day and age? How are you planning your life? Are you delaying gratification? Or are you even spending in advance? Because loans, if you want to live in a house that you have not earned, you are going for mortgage to be able to live in an estate that you can actually say, I live in this place. It's the name. Or you want to drive a car before you have earned the money to own a car. And a car is very expensive to maintain, by the way. Wow. It's a fuel. <laughs> Insurance. Nowadays, parking at a tower, parking itself. Eh, car wash. And the places you also to go when you are driving, you don't just go to any other place. So it, 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 it makes you spend more to fit in. So what I'm asking is, when you are deciding how you are going to spend your money, do you make it fast before you take your family for an outing? And the location you take them, does it correspond with your current income? Nothing wrong with going once in a while, but making it the style that will have a problem. Holidays. In fact, nowadays, I went somewhere, I was coaching some people, and when we did an analysis, I heard that quite a number of them had even taken a loan to go and pay dowry and others to do a wedding. Imagine a loan. Hey, <laughs> harusina alone. Hello, and you are going to pay with interest. These, some of these things are horrible. Others want to have iPhone X and they take money to go buy iPhone X so that they can be able to brag. 
you are the reason why I started with health and I try to impress upon you to take control of your health is because diseases wipe out all the money that you've been working hard and saving. You deny yourself, you save the money, then you get a lifestyle disease like kidney failure because of your feeding habit, dialysis. Dialysis is expensive, very expensive. Right now I have a friend of mine who is going for three dialysis per week, three. One is 9,500. You can imagine how much money that is, about 30,000. And somebody has to take him to hospital because he can't drive after dialysis three hours. Then there's time that uh, he needs to go for lab tests, which is paid separately to test the level so that he can know how they're going to do this. And when he sees the nephrologist, there's another consultation fee. And dialysis does not know it is Christmas week. There's no holiday. It doesn't know it's Easter. So the body itself is not able to filter toxins. It's being done by a machine. That means in one year, he spent that 9,500 times three times 52. How much money is that? And you add in the money of transport, the other person taking him to hospital, he does not go for work that day, he's waiting for him, and the pain and the, ugh, why? Because of lifestyle. So let's take care of our health so that you're able to move. This is not all. Some even spend in advance. People borrow to spend in, and that is tantamount to living your life in advance. A consumer loan is equal to living tomorrow's life today. The question I normally ask, what will you do when tomorrow comes? Because you have taken your tomorrow's life today. What will you do? Examples of the loans that we take. Read for me this one, Gary. So the examples, yes, examples is uh, we have car loan. Car loan, number two, mortgage, number three, furniture or gadget loans, number four, school fees loan, number five, luxury loan, like a holiday, medical bill, dowry, or wedding loan. So the question is, how do you relate with your money? Thank you, Coach Maina. Back to you. Yes, thank you very much. And that's, I want to ask you this question. And you ask yourself this question. I am not asking you, ask yourself this question. Could you be gravitating towards this or you're already there? I went to another place and uh, people were telling me that uh, hey, our circle is very good to give us school fees loan. Then I asked, surely, school fees, you know, you should go for a loan when it's an emergency. School fees, you know that you'll be needing school fees. Do you know if you go for a school fees loan, you are paying the fees for your child higher than what the school is charging. It's just a convenient thing and somebody else is benefiting from you. If you get it from the bank, look at the interest. If you get it from the circle, Look at the interest. And it is rare that you get somewhere you're getting this loan one on shilling for shilling. There's always some interest. Even processing fees, they are taking away your money. So are you in this area doing these things? Disclosure. Kenyans make mistakes with money because we are not taught all about money and how money works. That is the biggest problem. It's not our mistakes. I'm sorry if you heard that I was hitting you so hard. Now, let's become friends because I know I made these mistakes. That's why I'm an experiential trainer. I passed through all that. And that's why I'm good in it. We were not taught how to relate with money. Me, I was not taught at home. My parents didn't have money. My teachers did not have money. Even my preacher, my, my pastor, uh, prosperity gospel had not come that time when I was growing up. So, chapa apia wa walikuwa wana struggle kama sisi. When I went to college, by the way, when I was in college, our professors were very broke. Very broke, by the way. Did you come ask me to a chapa? Maybe nowadays, I'm going to be a consultant. I'm going to be Azima Wellness exists to teach people this critical area of money because people ignore it and it is everything. Why? An architect is paid with money. A doctor is paid with money. A lawyer is paid with money. A mediator is paid money and a coach is paid money. Can we escape money? We can't. Our schools do not teach money. Even in graduate school, they don't teach it. That one I, can, I know because being there, done that. This is what 
we are trying to bridge that gap. Money is one form of power, but what is more powerful is financial education. This is what we need so that we can be able to grow and help each other to see what we can do. Thank you very much. This is an outline. I say that uh, this topic is not a topic that you can exhaust. I wanted first we see how we can be able to get ourselves to relate with money in a good way. And from there now we can be able to get going. I hope I have some minutes on Gary. I can uh, take questions. I can get, uh, I can clarify anything. So I want you to moderate that session. I don't know how many times I still have. Then I can now be able to take in any question that come in this space because this is my area of strength. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Coach Maina, for uh, walking us through this uh, segment. So, uh, uh, fellows uh, on the program, so today is our Smart Weekend and our focus is on financial wellness and uh, also together with uh, the tech and ODR. And uh, this presentation that you've given us is actually a very, uh, it's a very good mouthwatering us, mouth, mouthwatering. And I say mouthwatering just as a place to be able to uh, ignite in us the appreciation that uh, fin financial is part of wellness. Because I think that's also something else that uh, uh, is, not, is not necessarily at on our face, on our face value. When we think of wellness, with vitae wellness and health and mainly on physical health. Uh, the presentation that you've given us has just journeyed us through in terms of just the, the significant difference that it makes when someone is able to be financially uh, well, then how it impacts on the other areas uh, that relate to life. Um, and uh, so with that, um, allow me to be able to pick on uh, a couple of inquiries that had been able, had come in um, uh, earlier and uh, uh, as we also receiving comments uh, on the chat and uh, any inquiries. So we have there, yeah, thank you. The, the presentation was a very good presentation. Um, so Coach, uh, Coach Maina, when yes. you say that, uh, uh, that money is not taught, what do you really mean? And when I say that because uh, children, I mean, from, from when one is a child, you, you would probably be sent to the shop, go and buy bread, go and buy potatoes go and pick and sometimes yeah when you're going you're going carrying some money or you're supposed to go and pick go and go and get salt and come and and, and bring it home so sometimes you're sent with money sometimes it's a shop that they know you they know your family you pick and come back uh go to <clears throat> go to the neighbor's house and the neighbors sell sukumawiki so come with five bunches of sukumawiki which you're going to cook today and to eat with the ugali so when you're saying that money is not taught yet exchange is happening uh, then where is this ball either dropped or where can this ball then be tied in together because i think we really know where to go shop thank you yeah. so thank you. Good question. and also tying back into a, a statement you gave the Yes, yes. So the second one, if I may just loop it in, there's a statement you say that when we take loans, we are leaving tomorrow now. Could you please just help us to just understand that? And I say that because um, the understanding and the appreciation that also uh, the investment groups, the chamas we are in, is they are there so that we can be able to, to, you know, to borrow. And anyway, when we borrow, that's how we make our, our investment groups, our circles better, and we have more dividends. So just help us to really just understand that part and how as uh, persons who've gone through now this introduction to financial wellness, we can be more astute, still benefit from those great dividends, but yes, have our own wellness financially. Thank you. Over to you, Coach Maina. Thank you. Thank you very much. Those are very good questions. I can see you are listening and uh, you are actually uh, in processing and interpreting what it is that I was uh, driving at. Uh, and point is, children first. Let me start with the first question. There's a difference between exposed to money, exposed to money and being taught about money. That you are sent to go to the shops 
to buy goods. It does not mean that you are being taught about money. But by the way, that programming is very bad because the way you are programming that uh, money is only a medium of exchange. You have money here. In one the child, when he gives the money to the shopkeeper or whoever uh, it is that they are going to buy services from, and they get the service, the money goes away from them. And they know that if yes. you give him five bob, you know, like they were used to be given some pocket money or some uh, rewards, uh, some tokens. You go to the shopping center, you buy a soda, Coca-Cola, mm -hmm. Fanta, or sweets or mandazi. So you know, you, you want mandazi, not the money. So you want to give the money away and get the mandazi. That's a program that you are being given that uh, money is supposed to afford you pleasure. And that's why I gave three definitions of money. As a medium of exchange, as a store of value, and as a, what else did I give? I want to see if you are listening. Money is more than just a medium of exchange. It's a measure of value, it's a store of value, and it's a medium of exchange. So basically what we do when you're just giving our children money to go and buy, we don't tell them how money is earned. Parents, how did you earn this money? Do you take your children through a process where you tell them how you came to that money that you're using to send them to the shops? Because that is the missing link. And that's why Robert Kiyosaki says, financial education. And also I started by definition, finance, and money and fiscal policy, they are different. I say that money is not taught in school because spread sheet is not money. <laughs> spread sheet. There's more to it than just learning about spread sheet and accounting. Accounting, what you do is that you don't even learn how to make money. You learn how to account for money. So we need to get to understand what is the formula of making money? And above all, how does money work for you as the store of value? Because if you know how money stores value, then money becomes a faithful servant, servant that it can work for you. Let's say in 2008, the government privatized Safaricom. The shares we were buying that time at five bob, five shillings per share in Safaricom. Now, a share of Safaricom is how much? You can see what that five bob that you bought a share of Safaricom, you're still holding it. How much it has generated for, and you have been receiving dividend. Money is a store of value. So you put money into an investment, then it grows. That is not taught. And that's why most of the middle class, we earn money, we are buying the wrong things with money. On the loan, I want to say this, there's a good loan and bad loan. Go to those chamas. Go to those uh, nini, uh, groups, save money together. Only borrow money to invest. Don't borrow money to go and spend. Because what you are doing is that if you spend money that you have borrowed for consumption, not to do business or to put it where it's going to generate more, you are buying the same services higher than what you should have bought it. The process is work, save, accumulate, then buy. Work, save, accumulate, then buy. But what are you doing? You are jumping. You want to go and borrow, you want a car. You want to drive a car or a better car than what you have. So what do you do? Because there are people who are lending money. You know what they are doing. They are making money for themselves. They give you money that you pay with interest. Calculate how much interest. You pay for that 9 million mortgage. Imagine if you do that interest from the 9 million worth of a house, when you go and sign in, housing finance or in a bank. By the time you finish paying that loan in 15 years, how much will it have costed you? Is that what you want? That is why we say, we were not taught we are making those mistakes. We buy emotionally and we'll be doing emotional wellness next lesson because emotions, we are creatures of emotions. There's what we call emotional manipulation that is done by advertisements. Adverts practice emotional manipulation they make you like something beyond what it is, and then you can do anything to go for it. That's why we have got Tala, we have got uh, Nini M. Shwari, we have got Fuliza, we have got, ah, and there are many, and they are coming. Their target to get our money 
so that uh, they can uh, their money can be working for them. They give us their they give us their money. You spend it in advance, then you get hooked. So for professionals, I won't request mediators because most of the mediation cases I have seen, they are because of money issues. But the way we sorted money issues, even the fights, even the blips, the conflicts, there's a depravity angle. When you think that uh, your brother or your sister or your, uh, your grandchildren, uh, okay, uh, the children of your, your nieces and, and, and uh, nephews are going to take what you think is yours and they're going to finish it for you, that is the time conflicts come. But if there's enough for everyone to go around and you're even giving your philanthropic, can you imagine fighting over money and you're philanthropic? You are donating, you are paying school fees for the children, you don't even know, hey, hello. Conflicts will reduce in a very big way. Nowadays, I'm sorry to say this. I know Wangari and I know Wasiliana, you're very close to the church. I want to say that I'm disappointed that nowadays, almost all churches are at war. Even SDA that used to look very homogeneous, you can see they are fighting. And if you follow it up, you'll see it's because of money. And I think the only church that has stood out is the Catholic church. When this is Catholic church, it also ran in a Kimajibo style. It's church is independent, but money is the central figure. So for what I want to tell mediators today, if you sort out the money problems, if you can be able to help people get over this limitation on money and the relationship with money, we will have lesser work to deal with mediation cases because the moment you are able to take care of yourself and your money, then you do not have a need. You, have, you don't have depravity. So in wellness, even health wellness, when you have money and you can afford even to go for preventive checkups. I don't know how many people work of preventive checkups. It is important for your organs to be checked and see how they're operating because if you detect a disease early, it's easier to reverse. Like in Uganda, she was in a court detected at stage four. You can't do much about that. So I want to request us at our level. And I know I'm talking to the middle class. You are the people who even carry burdens of your siblings, of your parents, of your next uh, families, if you made a decision that you're going to educate them and you have to first ed educate yourself and then you empower them, we can reduce most of the problems you're having and we reduce the blips and conflict transformation will come in very strongly when we handle this area of money. And that's why I say that uh, the 50 minutes is kidogo sana, I have handled what are the kind of problems? I would want to have another time or very will uh, maybe organize for this when I can now show you what you can do with what you have. Kenya is a very brilliant country, but then do you know you people, I don't know if you noticed, the best hotel in the world today is in Kenya. A Kenyan hotel was voted the best hotel in 2021. That shows you how well placed we are. The influx of people since we became borderless Africa. Kenya, again, is number one in terms of the country that people in Africa are aspiring to go. We have got over 27,800 people applying to stay in Kenya. And how much the government is charging? 400,000 for our permit. 400,000. In fact, I was even thinking that the government is making a mistake, but they are making a lot of money. That kind of number of people who want to come and stay in Kenya is a very, very good. Look at it this way. The people who come to work in Kenya, like Michael Joseph was sent here by Vodafone to establish Safari Com. After his tour of duty, the guy is still around here. And even Bobu Kolemu, and, and may the Lord rest his soul in peace. He was my friend and I respected him. He did very well. Why? Because he wants to stay here. This country is good. Ranbaga. The ambassador was sent here by Obama. Eh? To settle here. So this country, I want us to shift our mind and see the good things that there is in this country. When you start recognizing the potential in this country, and we have anything we need to be able to start living the dream. Kenya is a rainbow country with all nationalities. In Mombasa, we have Arabs who belong there. Niwa Uko, Niwa Kenyan Arabs. We have Asians who came here and are ready. They are here, they are Kenyans. We have got the 42 tribes of black Kenyans. Then you have got people from Zambia, the Shonas who are given citizenship, the Nubians. 
We have got people from Nigeria. We have got a lot of Kwasa Kwasa eh, from Congo. They stay here and they live very well. So Kenya, we have learned to tolerate each other. We have a way that we mix and we do things. It's for the politicians that remind us what tribe we are. I don't see tribalism in this country. Like now here in this Wasiliana, we don't know who is what tribe. It doesn't matter anything to us. Personally, I'm married from coast. I didn't marry a Kikuyu. My children don't know what tribe you can call them. So we are good. And this is how to transform conflicts. So I cannot have a problem with my brother and I'm tolerating people from elsewhere. So I want to request that Wangari, after all this is done, this area of money, I hope that uh, we can have another forum where I can take you through in a more detailed way what things that you can do to be able to grow your mediation and you yourself as a person and mediation and also you train people how to navigate this area. Back to you, Angari. Back to you, Angari. Uh, 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 Yes, the mediator Sarah, please proceed. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Coach uh, Maina. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much uh, for uh, being with us during the session. Thank you very much, Coach Maina, for taking us through the session on uh, financial wellness. I'm sure we have all been able to learn something. Um, I would just like to invite Coach Morenike. Coach Morenike, good morning. Good morning. Uh, great to have you uh, from uh, the western coast of the continent. How is the morning there today? Very well, thank you. Okay. Very. Any comments about financial wellness, which we have been taken through by Coach Maina? Well, I just want to say it's been a very enlightening and um, educating session. And I want to thank Coach Maina again, just like everybody else has done. A lot of times we take so many of these things for granted because we believe we know. But sometimes when we are, when we are, we, when we are reawakened by this kind of sessions, some of it, just like uh, Coach Mina had said, we can resonate with. Some we then learn from to do better. Some are things that we know and we've been practicing. Some are things that we, we, we just need someone to tell us we're in the right direction or we need someone to tell us we, do, we don't need to go there. So I think it's been a very good session so far. Thank you, Coach Ryan. And thank you. And uh, as his examples have mainly been from Kenya, do you think they equally apply to the Western part of the continent and any other part of the world? Definitely, we're all human beings, and um, as professionals, we're all members of that middle class that he talks about. So it's just um, the same thing across, but whether it's Nigeria or Ghana or Kenya or South Africa, you find out that the professionals, because of the manner we live our lives, we're the ones who live in the urban areas, and we in Nigeria, we call it the wannabe. You want to belong. And so there's that pressure to live where you don't, where you cannot afford to live. Send, uh, some people say your address is a very important thing. You, you don't want to tell in Nigeria, for instance, particularly in Lagos, which is a commercial center. People want to say, I live on the island. I don't go to the mainland because the island is much more expensive than the mainland. And the mainland is like the suburb of Lagos. And so all of those kind of, unnecessary pressures are things that put people under financial pressure to spend much more than the end. Yes, certain people can afford those lifestyles, but it is not everybody. Nigeria has 200 million people, about 30 million of those live in Lagos alone. Yes, we have quite a number of wealthy people, but it's not everybody, particularly professionals that are high paying, or high net worth individuals, but you find some people living off debt, just exactly what Coach Miner said, because they want to belong to a place where they don't belong to. Uh, thank you very much, Coach Morenike. Uh, please feel free to take us through with your station. In Kenya, we say Karibu, which is welcome. 
Caribou. Caribou, everyone. I'm just going to start sharing my slides and I'm just going to try and. Um... Caribou, good morning, everyone. Um, I don't know if I said the Caribou well, but my name is. Yes, Mora you did. <laughs> well done. <laughs> My name is Murai Nike Obifarinde, and um, I'm a mediator. Um, by way of introduction, I don't have the elaborate one that uh, Coach Miner had taken us through. And I would just uh, briefly say that I'm a lawyer of about 30 years, and then I ventured into alternative dispute resolution. So I am a mediator. I also arbitrate. I teach both mediation and arbitration. And then I got um, into the knowledge of how technology can actually improve alternative dispute resolution over a decade ago. And um, despite our limitations in Africa, I have thought that it's something that we could use. And I have tried to push that, particularly online dispute resolution in Africa. Just basically online dispute resolution is technology and dispute resolution. It's just a way of enhancing dispute resolution, basically. So I'm going to take us through what I call standards and ethics for online mediation, because we're all, I want to believe we're all mediators on this call. And um, I just thought, well, what would be important for us to look at? There's so many things that we take for granted that um, just like Coach Miner had given us a wake up call as to our financial wellness, I also want to, point out to us as mediators and as we move online because of, of course, the, the COVID uh, pandemic last year has seen our practice, so much of our practice move online. I don't know about uh, Kenya, but in Nigeria for so long last year, we we're all locked down. And so there was no way that we could come together whether to resolve disputes, even the courts were locked down for a long time. And so we've seen that so many of our mediations have moved on to Zoom. But as nice as it is to move on to Zoom, there are certain things that we need to take cognizance of. And that's why I call it standards and ethics for online mediation. And I want to thank Wangari and the entire Wasiliana Hub Up team for inviting me. Um, it's always a pleasure to be part of the group and part of the team to share and learn because I learn a lot. And I'm going to take us through uh, particularly the International Council for Online Dispute Resolution stand ethical standards. Um, the International Council for Online Dispute Resolution is an international body of professionals worldwide. It's also a group that I am a member of and actually a member of the board. I'm currently the secretary of that board. It's uh, situated in the US, but Aside from that, we actually have people from all over the country. It's a nonprofit and it drives development, convergence and adoption of open standards for the global effort to resolve disputes and conflicts using information and communication technology. As I said, I got introduced in about 2007 to um, online dispute resolution. And I thought and saw how fascinating it could be and how we could, it could improve our work as dispute resolvers. And since then, I just thought it would be nice to share this in the continent because it was something that we had not all taken cognizance of. And so that's why I thought to share with us some of those ethics, particularly as mediators when we go online. And ICODA promotes worldwide standards for all forms of technology assisted dispute resolution. So whether we're using Zoom, whether we're using our emails, whether we're using Google Docs, whether we're using um, DocuSign, whether we're using um, Skype, whether we're using Google Meet, ICODA tries to promote those standards that we must look out to on their side. For, of course, the reason why we go online, apart from the um, need to converge where there was there was no opportunity to meet face to face is to lower costs and of course protect consumers and citizens and the right to free access to justice. Because we all know that with technology, 
there's actually improved access to justice. And those are the things that we preach at ODR Africa Network, because what we want to see is that we want to improve and expand the availability to justice. People will say, oh, well, uh, what it means is that uh, when people, some people even still argue up till now that uh, mediation is just an attempt to put two people where they don't want to be. But the question I ask is, rather than not give them a choice at all, why don't you give them a choice at something? Because we all know, I don't know about you in Kenya, but in Nigeria, the courts are not accessible to everybody. And so many people go away without an opportunity even to find recourse for their hearts or their wrongs. And so that is why I have been in the forefront in Nigeria of promoting alternative dispute resolution, particularly mediation. And so the, the ethical standards of ICODA include both for video conferencing. Um, sorry, I think we have some. <laughs> we have for video conferencing. We have for. Uh, um, Coach Morenike? Yes, please. The slides do not appear to be moving. No, they are moving. I'm moving them myself. Uh, on our screen, we are still on oh, slide one. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. So you can't see anything now? Uh, we can see slide one. Just slide one? Yes. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no problem at all. Let me try again. Okay. Right now, can you, what can you see? Only slide one? Uh, yes, slide is one. Now? Is it moving now? No, not, not yet. yet. Oh my God. Let me see what is wrong here. Sorry about that. Can you see anything? Am I still sharing my screen? No, the screen share is stopped. stopped. Okay, so let me start again and see how that goes. Sorry about that. I actually didn't realize that analysis going on. What, can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. So what can you see now? Uh, slide two. Slide two, okay. So what I'll just do is to try and get um, the, the presenter view up so that you can have a clearer view of the slide, but you can see, um, can you see my slides properly now? Yes, but if you would go into the presenter view, that would be great. Uh, that's what I'll try and do right away. Can you still see my slide? we can but they are still small they're still small so i'm sorry about this <laughs> i think i have something wrong with my powerpoint or something if you would use the uh the blackboard or whiteboard icon at the bottom of your screen that might help okay i'll try just that. Uh, yes Try that because I have it on. Not, not that one. Just move on. Keep moving. Yeah. The next one. The next that one. one? No, 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 no. The next one. Yes, that's right. Okay. Great. Right. Thank Can you. Can you see my screen now? Yes, it's perfect. This is actually, what I was seeing, and I'm surprised you weren't seeing this, but it's okay. At least now we're back. Okay. So as I was saying, I've talked about ICODA, and I was actually on this slide uh, where I talked about uh, the different standards that ICODA has for training, for video conferencing, for um, uh, even for banks and payment systems, for consumer goods and all. So it's really general standards as to what not only mediators, but also providers of ODR generally should do. And the reason is not far-fetched why we have to do this. Apart from the COVID pandemic, we all know that there's a digital connection. You are in Kenya, I'm in Nigeria. There could be people from anywhere in the world on this call as we are now. So we see that there's that connection. And the connection is because of the easy, uh, easier access to the internet now because of, of course, the mobile 
that we carry. The uh, mobile networks are all over Africa and we see that internet users in Africa as a share of internet users wo worldwide has increased tremendously over the years. And the reason is not far-fetched. With a mobile phone, we find that so many much more people have access to the internet. And of course, when they have access to the internet, they also then generate conflicts over the internet. But we all know that the legal system doesn't work over the internet. We also know that ODR works the way the internet works. So when there's a dispute, ODR allows parties to find resolution within the internet. And of course, we know that, as I said earlier on courts, we're not working at normal capacity in most um, jurisdictions during the COVID. And up till now, even in Nigeria, there's still some restrictions. So the new normal that we live in, and this is world over, is that there are social distancing protocols, there are physical restrictions. And because of the closure of the courts or the uh, the court connected or even the physical dispute resolution centers that we had last year, we have additional caseload. And of course, all of this add to the, the conflicts that we need to deal with. And so what is online dispute resolution? I think originally, as I had said before, was designed basically as the use of information and communication technology to help disputants find resolution to their dispute. So ODR was originally developed to meet the needs of e-commerce companies like eBay and PayPal. And I have different definitions by different people. I, this I can share. But what has come on in the last couple of years that was not part of um, ODR, that was not envisaged, is the adoption of ODR by the courts. And the NCSC has defined ODR as a public facing digital space in which parties can convene to resolve their disputes or case. So even though it was originally developed to meet e-commerce businesses, we see that ODR has now expanded even to the courts. And, we, and I will show that even as we go on. And what are the different ways that we communicate for online mediation? Recall that I said earlier on that uh, we, we now do so much online, even as mediators. So we have emails, we have discussion boards, and we have chats, we have instant messages. And those I call asynchronous. We, what it means is that you don't have the other party being on the other side to respond. You can drop an email, I can respond whenever I get there. Even if we're on a discussion board, we don't always have to be online at the same time. And then sometimes you have blended systems where people can be online or not online at the same time. Of course, those ones like Modron, and if you go to modron.com, of course you have the audio where you then have the synchronous, like we're on Zoom now, it's a video conferencing, it's a synchronous communication. You have go to meeting, you have Skype, you have audio when you are using the telephone, because when you try to resolve your disputes by telephone, it's also, ODR because you are using ICT to enhance the dispute resolution process. And so I've talked about the ICODA standards and particular of interest, what I want to emphasize is the video mediation guidelines because we all just think once we get a Zoom account and we engage our parties, we are doing online mediation. That is not it. For online mediation to be effective, this podium or the system that is to be used must be accessible to all parties. Because remember in mediation, we always emphasize equality. The mediator is to ensure that both parties are treated equally and fairly, or else the mediator will be accused of bias. And then we have to be sure that whatever modium that we use, that the parties, that is accessible to both parties and comfortable to all the parties, is competent, competent to do what it is supposed to do for the parties. Of course, we cannot compromise confidentiality because mediation is not like the courts where everything is in the public sphere. And then fair, impartial, neutral. 
we still cannot take out all of the principles and the cardinal points of mediation because we move our mediation online. We must ensure that whatever platform that we use is secure. And so those are the standards also that ICODA teaches and preaches for online mediation. And I'm just going to take us through um, an example of an ODR practice dilemma. And it might be something that any one of us has come in contact with or something that we have not even thought about. But consider a situation where a property dispute shares about brothers living on separate continents. One brother in Brian participates in the mediation by telephone from KwaZuland, while the other brother, Harry, participates with three other lawyers by his side in Kweku City by video. We see someone is in a land, someone is in a city. The disputed estate includes several parcels of real property. Complex, complex structures are involved in the ownership of these properties. So during the mediation, Harry's lawyers tell Mad Max, the mediator, that any agreement reached needed to be subject to getting proper tax advice because of its complexity. Ibrahim tries, albeit unsuccessfully, to join in the video conference and seem to have an undisclosed advisor, whom we refer to as his technician. During the teleconference, which lasted several hours, the parties reached agreement in principle concerning the commercial settlement proposal. Harry's lead counsel declared that he thought they had done enough for the day and that everyone was hungry, tired, and worn out. He suggested adjourning until they were rested and could deal more constructively with the outstanding issues. Ibrahim also suggested getting his lawyer's advice. But Mad Max would hear nothing of that. Mad Max is the mediator. He insisted that the mediation continued until the settlement was reached, no matter how late or how long, and the fatigued lawyers foolishly capitulated. From this scenario, if I take us back to the um, standards by um, ICODA for mediation guidelines, I don't know whether we can have any one of the participants tell us what they notice, whether you want to unmute yourself or you want to just put it in the chat box, what you notice um, was unethical or that you might call unethical on the part of this mediator. Wangari, I don't know how can, do you want someone to be unmuted to do that or they just put that in the chat box? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, uh, Morinike, may, may I request that you go kindly, if you can kindly go back to the ICODA uh, standards. Okay. Just so that, and if you can kindly read for us the, 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 the headings, just okay. so that they are, yeah, just so that they are, uh, they are clear. Okay, okay. Thanks. Okay, Thanks. thank you. Okay, so the ICODA standards, they must be accessible, they must be competent, they must be confidential, there's fair, impartial, and then there's security. So from that, we see one person has access. Does the other person have access like the second person? Yeah. So accessibility, if, 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 if we may just have the, then the exchange with you. So yeah. that would mean that uh, then the accessibility, there is, there is the one who has accessibility and the one who doesn't have accessibility. So you or see that there's an imbalance there. Yes, yes. And then the other part is on competence. I yeah. think there is one that we are saying uh, is being assisted by- Exactly. He says it's a technician. We all know mediation yeah. is private and you shouldn't have any other person in the room because then you know that that, that is a problem. And then yeah. they are tired mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. there's a suggestion that they stop. stop. Because the, the agreement was signed before tax experts or the legal experts have been consulted. So as surely as night follows, they, once the experts were consulted, it was considered that they agreed upon amount would have undesirable taxation consequences. And to what resulted, a lawsuit so the reason why the lawsuit resulted is because of the several ethical breaches by the mediator, not taking cognizance of all of the ethical standards 
that he or she should have taken care of. So we must be careful when we mediate. I've looked at the different types of tools that we use. And in, in, even in all of these tools, we just must be careful to ensure that these ethics are abided. For instance, if, if I go to Zoom, let's take Zoom as an example, because we're all very familiar with Zoom. There's Zoom settings that you should take cognizance of. For instance, the host video must always be on because you also want the participant's video to be on when you start a Zoom meeting because you want to be sure that you are dealing with who you're dealing with. Because in the, on a good day, in a regular face-to-face -face mediation, you want to see the person because you want to connect because that is how you build or establish rapport. So the participant's video too definitely must be on. And of course, the audio type must be both computer and microphone. You have to be able to use personal, you have to be, you know, you have to lock your meeting. You don't just leave the door open. You won't do that in a face-to-face -face mediation. You have to be sure of who is coming in and who is not coming in. And you have to be sure that all of your information is kept confidential and use encrypt. So the, the, even Zoom has standards that you can adhere to and that you must, if you must use Zoom. You have to, for instance, enable your breakout rooms and not just assign them automatically. They have to be manually assigned. You have to be able to identify those who are in the room. You have to be able to take out even a Zoom bomber if you are having a mediation and you want the, party, a, a, the parties to share their screen, you have to enable that before then, if you want to. And if you don't want to, you also have to do depending on the mediation. At the point of convening for your mediation and the intake, if you had gone through with the parties, you would have known what will be needed and what will not be needed. And there are certain things you must disable. You cannot allow for instance, your parties to come into the room before you. So you have to disable join before host. You have to disable auto saving chats because you don't want the parties to record anything. You have to disable private chat because it depends on what the issue will be. So there are certain things you have to disable. For instance, remote control your meeting. You have to disable for instance, closed captioning and all of those things. There's certain things that you just must disable because they don't go well in a mediation setting. So it's not just enough that you get on a Zoom call and that um, you use Zoom, but there must be some. So these are just the different tools we use as mediators. And of course, all of this have security risk. For instance, if I send an email, I don't know who the person will send it to. I don't know where it will get to. So I have to be very careful, even though I'm in a mediation and I am using technology to assist in my mediation. I have to be careful the kind of information I pass by text, by email, or that I share. I, I have to pass or share information in this place where it is embedded. And I have to have, of course, the regular and the proper agreements as to sharing and data protection also. All of these are security risks that we face when we use technology. That's not to say technology is not a good thing to use because we see that it enhances dispute uh, resolution. I've talked about the Zoom, um, the Zoom settings, what you should enable and what you should disable. And um, I think with that, I have come to the end of my slides. Um, and I have that we have to meet parties where they are, or we face extinction. So I thought I actually had a few um, examples of um, um, software. There's so many software that we can use that are actually safe for mediation. So we, know, we just need to identify those and ensure that they meet world standards because we need to meet the parties where they are. We have to go on to mediate online, but we have to do it properly. Thank you. So I'll just take questions now, if there are any. Um, 
Thank you very much, uh, Coach uh, Morenika, for being able to take us through uh, that. Uh, participants, I welcome um, your response to the presentation by Coach Morenike. Any comments or questions? Uh, perhaps uh, Coach Morenike, I just want to uh, find out on behalf of the participants, is any, uh, is this uh, ODR useful or relevant for any type of mediation? Or is it for just very specific uh, kinds of mediation that is looking at specific kinds of matters? Well, I will tell you that you, just like um, in mediation, there is no one plus one is two answer that it just depends on your circumstances and your situation. That is what can, for instance, if you have, um, that it happens a lot in Nigeria where we have mediation and we have one party, irregardless of the subject matter, one party is outside the country and is not able to come in and is not likely to be able to come in for a long time. Rather than wait until that person appears, we can agree to have one person in person and the other party, whether by Skype or by telephone, sometimes even by WhatsApp. So it's really not related or limited to any particular type of dispute. It just depends on the circumstance because where there is that geographical uh, space between the parties, rather than do nothing or wait forever, just like we had during the pandemic, we saw that so many courts, some um, lawyers made applications in different parts of the world asking that their matters be adjourned. But the judges refused, especially in courts that had developed their online um, hearing systems well enough because they said no one knew when this would, would go away and no one knew when this would all be over. And so matters that had been slated for hearing maybe two, three years before, were actually held by the courts. So the same way, if you believe and the parties are comfortable with the medium you want to use, of course, you would have done the, um, like convening with the parties, going over whatever technology you would use, just like you would do in a face-to-face -face where you explain to the parties the process, your role, and all of that. This becomes part of a pre-mediation session um, um, logistics matter, as in the technology or the medium that is to be used. So you have to use something that works for everybody. So I don't believe there is any type of mediation that you cannot use technology. For instance, technology is even better suited where you have parties that don't want to see each other. You know, there are some parties that ordinarily you cannot bring together. Because if you do, they're likely to box themselves. I've had a mediation before that um, the two parties did not even know they were both. At least one particular party would not have come if he knew that. And there were siblings, if he knew that his siblings were in the same place, it was that bad. But with the uh, support of the lawyers and with that understanding, we made him believe he was just coming to meet with the mediators. But the other part were in another room on the other side of the court's house. So, and that was how we were able to shuttle between the two parties and try to get a resolution of the dispute. So sometimes technology can even be a benefit to you in those kinds of circumstances where the parties don't want to see each other or they're not in a position to even meet each other. And then the mediator can be anywhere, the parties can be wherever for as long as they are all agreed on the technology to use and they're all comfortable to use and they all have the equal access to that technology. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Coach uh, Morenike. Uh, perhaps you could just enlighten us a little bit. In one of your slides, you indicated that uh, ODR is not ADR. Yeah. What exactly does this mean and why is it important for us as mediators to be able to appreciate this? Thank you very much. That's a very good question, and I'm glad that you brought it up. You know, a lot of times, um, just like the lawyers were very, well, some of us that are lawyers, I know we're not all lawyers, were very skeptical about ADR, and they actually named it alarming drop in revenue, 
because they really didn't understand that ADR would only complement their practice and it could just then become another stream of income for them. They thought it was an alternative to legal practice. The same way ODR will not and is not planned to take over our work as dispute resolvers. It's going to just enhance and improve our work, make it more efficient and make it more cost effective. So technology will only assist the neutral. Technology will not take the place of the neutral. Yes, you can get people tell you, well, I know about Sophia Hansen that has been developed to be able to feel the emotions and they've touted that that will take over and be able to do mediation. There's artificial intelligence and there's a lot going on trying to see how machine can take the place of dispute resolution. You have negotiating uh, applications where parties can put in figures. One party puts in a bid, the other party puts in their own bid and they can come to a resolution and take away that and agree to be bound by the solution. Yes, but it still doesn't mean that ODR will take the place of dispute resolution. Practitioners, it would only enhance our practice and assist us to be better able to serve the parties and work with the parties. Because for instance, you have one party in um, Kenya, the other party is stuck, maybe he or she cannot travel for one reason or the other in London. And then um, the company is in Kenya, maybe the dispute arose out of a relationship that they have in Kenya. You are able to resolve the dispute because of you, because you have the aid of technology, rather than leave it and allow the business to completely disintegrate because this other person cannot come back. I don't know if you, you understand what I'm saying. So you see, it's not about taking the place of ADR, which the parties, for instance, had signed to be the dispute resolution rather than going to the court. Say the parties had signed, they want to resolve their dispute by mediation, to be appointed maybe by the Kenya High Court, one mediator, and to do it within 30 days. You don't have to stop that agreement because that other party can't come back. Technology will assist you to do that. So it doesn't take the place of um, AGR. That's what that means. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Coach Morenike, for, for that. At least uh, helping us to see that you know, technology is not going to replace us as uh, mediators. Uh, we do have uh, some of us fellows who are, uh, you know, um, addressing topics related to mediation, uh, I mean to technology, and uh, some of these have just uh, flashed on the screen. Uh, so for example, we have the place of mediation in promoting access to justice in Kenya. And uh, we also have, uh, just give me a minute, uh, the place of technology in mediation practice. Perhaps if you could share some uh, insights with this uh, particular fellows, and uh, also just uh, talk to us a little bit about what, what, what you see uh, the space looking at, looking like in the next five to 10 years. Thank you very much, um, Mediator Sarah. I think for me, the place of technology in mediation practice is, uh, is at its, I, I will not say it's at its infancy, but it's at, it's, it's a, it is at that beginning just yet. But we are going to go so far, and we have gone so far, so fast. And the reason we have gone this fast, despite that we've been at it for about a decade, is because of the pandemic. Because the pandemic pushed so many of us, particularly to Zoom, to use for our mediation practice. It allowed most people to move from physical practice, face-to-face, mediation to online mediation without even giving it a thought. So I see technology in mediation practice in Africa generally, not only in Kenya, but in Africa generally, moving so fast. We have, for instance, in Nigeria, we started just, uh, we just started what we call the Kilumaya Center. And the Kilumaya Center is um, an online platform where you can actually start your mediation from beginning to end without even having to have a face-to-face -face meeting. I'm, I'm sure you're all aware about the Utatusi Center in Kenya. Um, it's an online platform also for mediation. 
We also have so many other um, um, organizations that have hybrids between online and face-to-face -face mediation. So <clears throat> if you then ask me, what would have happened if we did not have technology? This is to address the person, of, person who, who is writing on promoting access to justice. If we did not have all of this, what it will mean is that those people would not have had access to find resolution to their disputes. And all of these opportunities or platforms improve access to justice. For instance, I'll give you an example. In Nigeria, for so many years, if you opened the newspapers, when e-commerce just started, you would find we, we have like two pages in the middle of um, the dailies that they usually use for like um, feedback from readers. And you would, I always used to see so many complaints of people who bought things for say 10,000 Naira and couldn't get a redress. But if we have a technology-based OGR system or a platform where people can go for little or nothing or where retailers have subscribed to be able to resolve the disputes with their consumers available, then all of those disputes will not go unresolved. And of course, it will improve access to justice. So rather than people, particularly even, let's look at small and medium scale enterprises. Their businesses are not so large that they want to stay locked up in a courtroom or that they want to pay so much for arbitration. So if we have platforms using mediation, because we see that, at least speaking from my experience in Nigeria, we see that a lot more small and medium scale enterprises opt for mediation because it's a better dispute resolution model. So when we then add technology to that and we're able to then get to the lower value claims, we will see that there's an improved access to justice for all. Because just access to justice is not just about for certain people, it should be for the broader society and the community. So whether my grouse is over something I bought for 10,000 Naira or 1 million Naira, I should be able to seek redress somewhere and somehow. And so that, that, that's, that would be my answer of the place of technology in um, improving access to justice. And of course, in the mediation practice, just as I have said, we have all moved, most of us, I don't know that there's anyone who has not had the chance to do some mediation online, whether the person thought about the implications or not, or the ethics to it. We just, well, you know, my grandmother uses Zoom. So parties, you should be able to use, suggest Zoom to them and they tell you, okay, yes, yes. My son or my daughter has taught me how to use Zoom. I can use Zoom. Okay, we can, we can try to have this mediation session by Zoom and you are on it. So that's it. So technology is here to stay and it's not going and it's only improving. And we see that our telecom providers to continue to improve the um, value of the internet service that we have, our internet service providers. Those would be my comments on that for now. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Coach uh, Morenike. Uh, we appreciate uh, you sharing those insights with us and of course, uh, reminding us that, you know, we still have a place and a role to play, but at the same time, we have to be very quick to learn uh, ask for assistance if need be. So we take those in and we will work with them. Uh, Coach Miner. Uh, Coach Miner. Yes. Uh, if you could uh, share with us your insights, uh, any comments that you might have as well uh, concerning the presentation from Coach Morenike, kindly. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Coach Morenike. I salute you and I have uh, really got into your presentation. I was seated here wondering why we have not taken it uh, to that direction. The technology has made it easy for us to be able to bring people together who are the disputants. I have had mediation cases that the people, the, uh, the people who we are trying to bring together 
having high emotions, but putting them in one place to start now talking is a bit of a problem. But now I'm seeing the advantage in Kenya, we are very ahead in uh, terms of uh, internet connectivity. We have our 4G almost in every area. And even those who we are working with who are outside, they have to fly in, uh, can see that uh, our work is going to become very easy. Somebody does not need to come from Obasa to have a sitting in Nairobi and others in Eldoret and many other areas. So thank you very much, uh, Coach Morenike, because already Nigeria, I'm happy that uh, you have taken it another level. At least you are our bigger brother and we are learning from you. So what I've gathered is that uh, we are blessed and uh, I want to thank Wasiliana for championing this because this is something that I had not figured out going to take radiation online. But now the way Morenike has put it up, I'm just seeing possibilities. And uh, this is something that we need to get into and make it a reality. And I commit personally, I am already excited and I'll uh, be talking to you coach to guide me to get started so that I can get other people to join me after I have learned how to get this happening because it's the first time. I've never thought about it, but now that I have been exposed to it, I will be coming in and thank you very much. You're always welcome. It's a symbiotic thing. I have a lot to learn from you too, so. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, um, thank you very much, Coach uh, Morenike, and thank you very much, uh, Coach Maina. We appreciate, and uh, we, of course, do agree that we have plenty to learn from one another. I will invite uh, uh, Mediator Wangari to be able to uh, give some comments and uh, way forward. Mediator Wangari. Okay. Asante Sana, and I thank you uh, for uh, uh, walking us through as our moderator today. Uh, Mediator Sarah Atero, thank you very much for that uh, a very powerful support to the mediators community that you continue to provide as a moderator for the fellowship program, uh, together also with uh, Mediator Emerald Midega and also uh, the coaches, I mean, really, they just are taking us to another level. And one of the great things is that uh, it's also uh, occurring for us that uh, we are not the only ones who are, who are students as the fellows, but it's also just across even for our even for our our uh, coaches and also the, the 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 teams that are just supporting us in this program and and that really just speaks into uh, when uh, we have this uh, fellowship program as uh, as as Vasiliana have I mean why are we really doing this and you know where are we heading uh, with this and why are we so keen and um, interested in this in, in this particular program. And so we thank you, uh, Coach uh, Morenike uh, Obifarinde, and also we do uh, thank you, uh, uh, our, our fellowship coach, uh, Coach Maina. Uh, fellows, we believe that this has been a very insightful uh, session for all of us. And uh, not only has it been insightful, but, but we have things that we can be able to pick on and to be able to um, advance, to use them as we advance into other areas of our interests and also to be able just to move move this work that we are that that we are keen and interested in as as, as mediators and so um, just to take us back into the rationale of the fellowship program as uh, we do get into the closing uh, the fellowship program is a five month program that is running from July to uh, the month of um, of November this is a, a program which uh, as Wasiliana Hub, uh, together we were able to design together with the partners. And the key thing that we were looking at is that as mediators, mediators are here to be able to support uh, communities, businesses, families, and nations, not only to be able to draw up uh, fellowship agreements, but the interest is that mediators uh, are, are out there to be able to support the communities, uh, businesses, families, and nations to be able to do much more. And that is why this is a program that's designed around as a program on conf under the program on conflict transformation, because the goal is that the outcome of this program is that we will be able to have conflict transformation uh, mediators. 
And when you talk about conflict transformation mediators, then we're talking about people who have a deeper interest, not just on the face value of the dispute, but we have a deeper interest on the people that we are actually uh, engaging with. And I think that really ties in also with um, a statement that came from uh, uh, our fellowship coach, Coach Minor, when he talked about that if we have a greater understanding, if the people we are dealing with in mediation have a greater understanding on their financial wellness, then that would have, have, have a very deep uh, impact on the, on the ability for them to be able to resolve most of or, or quite a number of the disputes. So the fellowship program, uh, as we are taking it, we are going forward into the lead in summit, which will be hosted in, on November 19th to the November 20th. And uh, yet back again, we take this opportunity to remind fellows that uh, this will be a 24 hour summit that we are uh, hosting as um, the uh, Wesleyan Hub community. And uh, it's actually being hosted by the fellows. And that is why it is important that as fellows that we do uh, continue to work on our fellowship topics. Working on our fellowship topics has various stages just so that we can in, uh, enhance our ability and our acumen to become uh, speakers, presenters. The first stage is, yes, the matriculation weekend where we did a short presentation to the fellowship director. Then from there now we have the uh, writing a, a blog of 500 words on your topic. And uh, we commend the fellows who have been able to send in. So please remember if you've not sent in, let's just make this weekend to become just the closing weekend where you have sent in. Uh, followed uh, to that, then we have our fellowship groups where each of our fellows is within um, uh, uh, an accountability circle. And within the accountability circle, we also have uh, a number of activities that we will be doing uh, when we are part of the accountability, uh, accountability circle. We have writings that we will do as part of the, uh, the fellowship accountability circle. So we, we have writings on uh, mediation service centers, public policy uh, interests, court connected mediation and also on mediation advocacy um, uh, planning. And the aim of this is just that we are just raising or enhancing the ability of fellows to be able to show up and speak. Coach Morenike uh, for today has come and talked to us about um, the, the area of uh, uh, ethics and standards in mediation, an area she's passionate about. It has come from practice. It has come from writing about it, presenting on it. Uh, our fellowship coach today, Coach Maina, keeps talking, has talked to us about wellness over the last couple, three, three months, and he's going to keep on for the next uh, two months as we carry on with the program. This is an area he has worked on uh, with himself. And that's the rationale of the design of the fellowship program, that we have various things that we are doing individually and also as a group. So yet again, just as an emphasis, so that we are able to move on to the next part, which is uh, on the official pairs, the activities that we are required, we are going to be doing together. Kindly let's have our 500 words blog sent in. Yet again, congratulations to all the fellows who've sent in. We had a couple that also came in this week. Let's send them in so that we can now be able to move to the next part without um, too much, uh, let me say, work that is um, on, um, on us. So with that, uh, we will be able to go back into closing. Allow me to please uh, send us back to our uh, moderator, that is uh, mediator uh, Sarah Ter. Mediator Sarah Asante Sana, thank you for having us uh, on this particular day. So Mediator Sarah, back over to you for um, the cl any closing words and uh, the uh, national anthem. Mediator Sarah. Thank you very much. Uh, fellow mediators uh, for being present uh, for us. Glad that you were able to join us. Uh, we'll just be able to conclude with the words of the national anthem, Coach Minor. The national anthem in English, O oh God of all creation, bless this our land and nation. Justice be our shield and defender. May we dwell in unity, peace, and liberty. Plenty be found within our borders. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being present for this session. We look forward to the next session uh, next month, the third week of October, and have a pleasant weekend.